This isn't Earth. In fact, it isn't any planet we know of. But it could be. With our space telescope, we could be looking at an image very much like this in as little as five years. You see, we've designed what is perhaps the most powerful and most affordable telescope yet drawn up. Why? Because our horizons are too small. Sure, there's jungles and caves and some glacial lakes yet to explore, yet to be charted. But there's no new continents, no new islands unless a subsea eruption makes one. Humanity needs to be free, free to expand, explore, free to learn, to discover, free, free to become better, wiser, more just, more human. We can't do that if we're all bottled up on one planet, or even in one small system. Out there lies an entire universe, and closer to home, closer even than the nearest star, though it stretches nearly that far are trillions of comets, thousands of worldlets, and dozens of worlds on equal footing with Earth, or even dwarfing it, worlds that could one day be brought to life. Nearby, we have at least three systems that may contain habitable worlds, other Earths. One is a young system, Ran, formerly Epson Eridani. Another, Alpha Centauri, is at a distance of a little over 270,000 times the distance Earth is from the Sun. For comparison, the cloud of comets and icy worlds orbiting a star extends 200,000 times the distance from Earth to the Sun, or around 5,000 times the distance of Pluto to the Sun. To begin with, to start this grand space project, we must first have a telescope to find these other worlds, other potential Earths. To this end, in June 2020, we published a paper on our telescope design, which we call the Planet Seeker into Ferrama. Unlike current space telescope designs, the Planet Seeker does not require large, expensive mirrors, nor delicate optics. The Planet Seeker, you see, is a gigantic multi-part laser telescope. Buzzword salad, right? Hardly. Let me break it down like this. Conventionally, a telescope has a collector, usually a mirror, but it can also be a lens, as was used in the earliest telescopes. A single telescope has a single collector. Simple enough. One mirror or one lens to collect light onto your eye, film, or a CCD. But there's no reason the collector needs to be in one piece. If you cut a mirror into many small pieces, discarding most of the material so that you now have many small mirrors with gaps between, and you aim the mirrors at your eye or a camera's CCD, what do you see? If you are careful to aim the reflected images so that the image from each individual mirror overlaps, then you see a single image. Not many, just one. One image. The same trick, so to speak, applies for lenses as well. If light from many small lenses is focused so that the edges of each image from each lens lines up, then you have a single image. This is the basic operating principle of the Planet Seeker. Many, many very small lenses are placed in space, aiming their individual images to a single thin sheet that acts as a focusing lens and combiner, projecting a single image to a camera, which records and transmits what it sees. The focusing sheet is much like a beam combiner as used in laser optics. In fact, it's practically the same. Here's the thing. In order to combine many separate images into a single image with the resolution of a single part telescope, we must use some laser optics trickery. The camera also contains a laser. This serves two functions, but we'll come back to the other function later. The outgoing laser light is mixed with the incoming light from the individual lenses, 
In technical jargon, we say that the laser light undergoes constructive and destructive interference with the incoming light from the lenses. This is where the term interferometer comes from. By mixing laser light with the collected light, the images produced by the individual lenses can be combined like normal laser beams and are amplified, that is, the brightness and contrast of the images can be enhanced. Now what of the other function of the laser? Well, that would be to suspend the tiny lenses. The singular laser beam is split into multiple beams by the focusing sheet, operating in reverse. Part of the now split beam is directed to a large thin reflector, placed so that the individual lenses lie between it and the laser source. This produces two opposing beams, or rather two opposing sets of beams which act on the lenses from either side, and are able to hold the individual lenses in place with more than enough force to maintain stability indefinitely. Experiments by multiple parties have already been conducted, demonstrating the feasibility of this technique. How many lenses do we intend on? What could the planet seeker actually see? Everything. No, not really. We need at least a solar system sized telescope to even approach that, but we'll get there. Baby steps. In astronomy, we speak of angular resolution. In layperson's terms, this is simply the smallest something could appear to be and still be seen with clarity. Anything smaller will be an indistinct blob and anything larger increasingly crisp. For the planet seeker, this resolution is 1.25 micro arc seconds. What does that mean? How small is that? For context, Earth's moon, Luna, has an apparent size in the night sky of 31 arc minutes. The human eye can, on average, see something that appears about as small as an arc minute. A milli arc second is about the size of a person's thumbnail if they were sitting atop the Eiffel Tower, as seen from New York City. And a micro arc second is about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in the Apollo mission manuals left on Luna as seen from the surface of Earth assuming they left a page open to an earth-facing window, of course. So a comma, or perhaps a colon, in the Apollo mission manuals on Luna, as seen from Earth's surface, is about the smallest apparent size that the planet seeker could clearly see. With this resolution, the Planet Seeker Interferometer Telescope can see an island the size of Borneo from 10 and a half light years away. Think about that. Something so far away that light itself takes 10 and a half years to travel there. And only about 600 kilometers across. Think about how small that is from Earth, and yet the Planet Seeker could see it. Think of the image we started the video with. I wasn't being jocular. An island as small as Java could be seen on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system. Planet 9 could be sought out and imaged. Nemesis, Old Soul's hypothetical brown dwarf twin, and the source of much contention debate within the astronomical community, especially with recent findings, if it exists, could be imaged with the planet seeker. There's obscure work suggesting that there may be a roughly Earth-sized comet at about a quarter of the distance to Planet 9. This too should be imageable if it exists. If exosolar intelligences have extensively urbanized their planet, even if it is a dozen or so light years distant, we should be able to detect traces of this too. Oh my, and if exosolar intelligences have built Dyson spheres, we should most definitely be able to image them. Wandering black holes with minimal accretion disks? Much easier to find now. You might be wondering at this point how feasible this all is. Quite feasible. While we do propose launching one million individual lenses, these lenses are truly only 30 millimeters across. That's about an inch. And the lenses are only pieces of laser etched plastic film, which can, using a new technique which we reference in our paper, be mass produced quickly and inexpensively. Make sure to check the video's description for a link to the most important references, 
and also make sure to read over the paper itself for more detailed information and an exhaustive list of references. It honestly took me the better part of several weeks to collect the references together. The rest of the telescope is simply two more thin sheets, a focusing splitting sheet and reflector, plus the camera and laser source, with one to three launches. And unlike other telescope designs, such as the much-hyped Solar Gravity Telescope, the Planet Seeker can be built today. Today. Right now, if we had the funds, we could start construction, and in as little as five years, the telescope could be launched and able to begin operations. With only 36,000 of the tiny lenses, the Planet Seeker would already have a total collecting area equivalent to the James Webb Telescope. Even with this much smaller quantity of lenses, the resolution of the Planet Seeker would be far superior to any other telescope in production or existing, as the lenses can be spaced out across 100 kilometers, 62 miles, or nearly any spacing desired. Via the laser-assisted mixing of light from the individual lenses, the resulting resolution of the telescope is equivalent to a single lens or a single mirror telescope with a diameter equivalent to the largest separation between individual lenses, which we take as 100 kilometers in the base design. The basic design is similar to and inspired by another design, the Hypertelescope, proposed by a professor Antoine Le Berry in 1996, and steadily worked on by him and his team for almost three decades. They have already set up and taken images with a small prototype in the French Alps, with much success. The Planet Seeker, though, differs from the Hypertelescope. It is digital. Unlike similar designs, the Planet Seeker interferometer makes use of digital interferometry, which provides greater versatility, the ability to upgrade the image processing capabilities, and potentially allows for a cleaner and more detailed image. The Planet Seeker's camera not only collects incoming light, but will be equipped with a computer and software capable of analyzing the frequency and phase shift as well as the angle of the returning laser-like amplified images from the individual lenses, in order to determine which lens produced what image and at what time. This information is beamed down to the ground, where a waiting supercomputer uses ray tracing, as well as conventional digital interferometry techniques, to electronically produce a very high resolution final image. It should even be possible to reproduce the effects of more sophisticated optics, such as the pupil densifier designed by Le Berry and others, without the added mass and physical complexity such equipment would introduce. By virtue of its design, the Planet Seeker is sensitive from near IR to visible to near UV wavelengths. This allows for much greater flexibility so that planets, stars, black holes, etc and all manner of biomarkers can be investigated. Cost. Comparatively, the Planet Seeker is one of the most affordable telescopes to date. We estimate that the total cost of the telescope is between 70 and 80 million USD, including the cost of a facility, development costs, and using current launch prices. Additionally, a smaller, even more affordable prototype of the Planet Seeker could be built and operated on Earth. The ground-based prototype would be minimalistic and temporary, following a similar approach as the Hypertelescope team's own prototype, where the individual telescopes are little more than tripods with lenses or mirrors on them, aimed to a central focus. This way, the Planet Seeker prototype could, like the Hypertelescope prototype in the Alpe de Hoeta Provence, apologies for undoubtedly mangling that, could be set up within a designated park or wilderness without disturbing or disrupting the environment. Such a prototype would be capable of producing a workable, if small, image of a giant planet in nearby star systems, such as the recent candidate around Alpha Centauri A. Indeed, the prototype should not only be able to determine if the candidate planet around Alpha Centauri A exists, but whether or not it possesses any Earth-mass moons. With that, let's wrap this video up. First though, I'm going to conclude with something I said in the paper. This is a call to action. A foundation to get the ball rolling. To get things started. We have the technological prerequisites to design, develop, build, and launch 
a telescope capable of finding another Earth, another habitable planet. In a year's time, we could have an international organization developing a prototype of the telescope. And in five, we could together be watching its launch, knowing that the age of interstellar discovery is dawning. To begin with, we need to create a flyable design. All the bells and whistles, an absolutely complete and airtight final design. Following this, we will begin research and development of the hardware and software needed for the Planet Seeker Interferometer, testing and refining the technology by way of a ground-based prototype. Ultimately, this is perhaps the grandest and most important project humanity has ever undertaken. We cannot remain on Earth alone forever, nor even within our solar system. Sooner or later, the sun will die, and our very distant descendants will die with it, unless we take the actions necessary now to ensure that we become a star-faring species. The Planet Seeker is only the beginning of a grand adventure, an adventure of epic proportions, to explore and colonize distant worlds orbiting alien suns. If we take this step, if a brave few of us dare to go against the current, ignore cries of economic irrelevance and the impossibility of the task at hand, then our distant descendants will look back on this moment from their homes amongst the stars and wonder at the courage and vision of those mighty pioneers. Thank you. Stay safe in these uncertain times. But keep your eyes up. The stars are waiting.